In this panel discussion, the theme is uh, how will the world restore international cooperation and the liberal economic order? And the, those who are participating in this panel discussion, Mr. Josh, who I saw, I saw the uh, just a uh, yes. Thank you very much. Your video is on. Thank you. And so let's start this panel discussion. So I will introduce the participants. First of all, from Indonesia, Hassan Birayuda, former foreign minister of Indonesia, and the uh, Mr. Takehiko Nakao, former governor of the Asian Development Bank. And from the US, the uh, Rufus Jerfa, president of National Foreign Trade Council, and also former deputy director general of the WTO. And from India, from Observer Research Foundation, Chairman Sanjay Josh. And although I, he was supposed to be participating in this session uh, on online, but the uh, Mr. Hubert Vedrin, former foreign minister, uh, is unfortunately not participating. So uh, the moderator is Rohinto Mendora, President, Center for International Governance in Innovation Canada. So uh, over to you, Mr. M Mendora. Great. Well, thank you very much. And um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case might be. Um, we all have noted that um, in past years, uh, we would, uh, many of us, be uh, physically in Tokyo for the Tokyo conference uh, and of course this year we cannot be but I did want to thank the Genron NPO and uh, Yasushi Kudo in particular for still for those of us in North America at least giving us that jet lag feeling by having us up um, this early in the morning. Um, as, uh, as has been sort of advertised this, this panel is on a theme which in many ways animates the conference uh, since its inception. And it's something that uh, we, in fact, many of you on this panel have, uh, have touched upon at this conference and uh, throughout your career. So I will not um, uh, introduce in great detail our eminent panelists uh, because we have their bios uh, and it would indeed take a long time to do so, except to note that all of them have had uh, long and deep careers in both public policy, the private sector, and, and running the institutions that make up uh, global governance. Uh, and, and so the topic of how we restore democracy and the liberal uh, order is one that they're well versed in. Um, I guess, by way of background, I'd make two or three points. Uh, I, I think use of the term restore is deliberate and I suspect uh, appropriate, meaning that there is a strong sense that the precepts that have animated the post-war uh, global order have, have been fraying and have been fraying in the direction uh, away from um, liberalism and democracy. And so we might want to explore if that's the case and if indeed it is, what we do about that. So what, what might we say for now? Um, longstanding issues of the imperfect globalization that kind of got us in some of these social and, and economic inequities have not gone away. Perhaps they might have accelerated. Uh, changes in technology, uh, are also uh, of long standing and of a structural nature and, and perhaps animate some of the things that we will talk about. Uh, I call them legacy institutions. You can call them what you will, but the fact is the institutions we have and have had for several decades are functional. They are functioning, but they're not functioning, uh, one might argue, anywhere near peak. Uh, whether that's because uh, we need new ones or whether we need to retune existing ones is certainly something that the panel, I'm sure, will reflect on. Uh, we have a new administration in the U.S. Uh, taking a fresh lens at many of these issues, including the core relationship, the U.S.-China relationship, which we've touched upon in the previous panel and, in fact, yesterday as well. 
the Biden administration has been sort of saying all the right things uh, and in some cases doing all the right things in terms of restoring a certain liberal US uh, at the center of a global order. But the question is how much more needs to be done there. And so the US-China relationship and the new administration in the US is also uh, a foundational feature of this discussion. And last and not least, of course, uh, what has changed in the last year is COVID and the extent to which the COVID pandemic uh, has changed our discourse on these issues is something I'm sure we'll touch upon as well. Uh, we will ask um, Rufus Yerksa in this order, Rufus Yerksa, Hassan Wurj, uh, Judah and Taheko Nakao to speak for about eight minutes each. Uh, their opening thoughts on the theme. And then uh, I'm going to turn to my colleague Sanjay Joshi, who runs India's Observer Research Foundation, to perhaps respond in four minutes. And then we will have an interactive discussion as well. So Rufus, welcome and over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Robinson. And thank you to Jenron for this uh, opportunity to talk to you uh, about this important topic. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you talked about uh, the challenges to uh, a liberal economic order uh, in light of uh, many, many different trends and developments that are challenging. And I'd like to start by just focusing on a few factors, take a look at um, some of the important geopolitical relationships that will impact this and then talk from a US perspective, uh, given the recent change to a Biden administration and what that implies for potential <clears throat> US participation in uh, this new direction uh, of a liberal order. I think the biggest challenge we face is well and clear um, we want to restore something, it is unlikely that we can go back to exactly the same kind of um, both political and economic relationships and the global order that we had prior to, shall we say, the developments of the last decade or 20 years. Too much is changing too quickly and we have to look forward rather than trying to simply reset something that existed before. And I think there are obviously major factors that are driving this. First of all, a move to an entirely different kind of global economy driven by a lot of different factors, many of them technological, um, you know, the digital age uh, and all that that implies, uh, you know, the move to things like electrical, electric vehicles uh, and the move away from the internal combustion engine, artificial intelligence, the importance of data and the, uh, the strength of national economies will more and more be determined by abilities to master these new challenges. But we also have another very important change that is driving all of this. And that is uh, because of the massive impacts of a, of a global pandemic and also because of changes th that the political reaction to the, the technological developments I was just talking about, I think we're entering an age with massive government intervention, even in the most liberal uh, economies, which have had more laissez-faire approach to government intervention in the past. And I need only cite the $1.9 trillion economic package that just passed the US Congress and the fact that now they're talking about a new $3 trillion package that would involve both infrastructure uh, and new forms of, um, of regulation and taxation policies. So if that's happening in the United States and it is largely driven in reaction to developments that have already been occurring in the economic system, I'd start of course with the US-China relationship uh, which has sort of redefined the way Americans look at the global economy because of the rise of China. Uh, this is, you know, a relationship that is economic, geopolitical, military security. Uh, it involves issues, fundamental issues like 
democracy and human rights. But one thing that is very clear is the challenge of China as the rising power is driving the US towards a different approach um, to its own economy, as well as to multilateral cooperation. Of course, flowing from that, and we just heard the minister from Japan talk about this, how are other Asian economies uh, responding to these changes? Uh, you know, obviously forming new agreements like CPTPP, which after all was started by the US, but which now is seen as a counterweight to uh, some of the great power economic uh, forces. And then of course, the rest of Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, Korea, and, and uh, how they respond to these changing relationships. And of course, we see Europe now in a different dimension because it is struggling with the, with the effects of pandemic, but it's also you know, just do a, done a new investment agreement with China. It's looking at potentially um, new relationships with the CTPPP countries. Um, and so all of these realignments then raise the question of where do we go multilaterally in uh, systems like the WTO and the UN system itself and others uh, to respond to these changing dynamics and to the move towards much, much greater government intervention. And that raises a lot of questions about how we'll redefine the rules of the system with issues like subsidies, like state intervention. Uh, I would argue that the WTO still has the potential to be a very, very important central uh, organizing principle for our economic relations, but not if it remains static, only if it recognizes all of these changes I've been talking about and figures out how to create a new alignment. Um, and we mustn't forget, of course, the emerging powers like India, like Brazil and, and others who have gone through some real uh, changes recently, but which over the longer term will demand not only a part of this equation, but will have increasing influence on the equation. And then uh, let me turn finally, Robinson, to uh, a, a few comments about what is happening in the US because the domestic politics and the battles over what we do with our own economic policy all have major international implications. And you see this in the Biden administration now. I would argue that the Biden administration is instinctively much less uh, nationalistic and protectionist in its orientation than was the Trump administration. Um, but it clearly is dealing also with forces domestically that feel that many, many parts of our society and our economy have been left behind by globalization. And we need to re rebuild our economy, build back better. And that very often will have some troubling potential side effects for, um, for things like uh, our trade relationships. There are four big reviews taking place within the Biden administration right now, which I think will define its future direction. First of all, a, a major all of government review of US-China relations, and that is not just our economic relationship, but uh, military and security and technological. A review of supply chain security and what the US needs to do to have more resilient and uh, better regulated supply chains. That has a big trade implication, but it's also driven by the kind of fears that the pandemic raised about, for example, our medical and, and drugs sector and other things. A review of tariff policy. This is should be good news for the world, but it's not clear what the outcome will be for the time being, even though the Biden administration wants to improve its relationship with our, with our traditional key allies and most friendly trading partners. And that would imply reducing some of the tariffs that have been introduced, but an overall review of these tariffs, well, the meantime, they really haven't fundamentally changed the Trump tariffs, either the uh, national security tariffs that were imposed on steel and aluminum or the very, very massive tariffs on China. And of course, that's connected to the review of China. And a review in another area by America, I think this is important because 
um, even though government procurement is relatively small part of total global trade, it obviously uh, it sends a major signal if they overshoot the mark and in an attempt to um, sort of restore US-based production become too protectionist in government procurement, that will provoke reactions around the world. If you look at the things that they talk about rhetorically in the Biden administration as the new sort of focal points of US trade policy, you will hear terms like a worker centric trade policy. This is, I think, just sort of right now rhetorical, but how does it translate in these different reviews they're doing and the policies they will bring in? Because it suggests that past trade agreements and trade negotiations have focused too much on the interests of corporations and not enough on the interests of workers and how that will then translate into a new negotiating agenda will be interesting. But at the same time, other big sort of pillars of their thinking, one is much more focus on values on the environment, which means of course the US supporting a climate change component of our new trade agreements, um, restoring alliances in the world. Um, and that of course gets back to the tariff issues. How can we restore better relations with our trading partners if we're not moving in the right direction in terms of trade barriers? And key values like human rights, labor standards, worker standards. You saw that in the, in the USMCA negotiations, a whole new platform for enforcing worker standards. And this will be another important component. I will stop there. I look forward to the rest of the discussion and hope my intervention was, was helpful. It absolutely was. Thank you. You've, you've got uh, us off on exactly the start uh, we wanted. You've made several points. I know we will come back to them all, but I thought that your view from Washington is one that I know we will value, but you made two other points that uh, I know we should come back to. One is about the organization and system you know so well, which is trade and the WTO. So stay tuned for that. And I thought the point you made about COVID having changed and perhaps uh, increased the role of government uh, across the board while at the same time raising all kinds of stuff, issues of unwinding from stimuli uh, is also one that I know we will want to com come back to. So thank you again. We next move to uh, Minister Wirajuda. So welcome back, sir. Good to see you again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Medora, the moderator. Kudusan, German, Chairman of General NPO, fellow panelists and distinguished participants. <clears throat> Recently, the Economist magazine published a cover story in conjunction with the 75th anniversary of the adoptions of the United Nations Charter called the New World Disorder on its edition dated 20th of June last year. The article came at the heels of an earlier edition from the weekly magazine, which has as its cover story, Goodbye Globalizations. Globalization is not similar to world order. The former strengthened the world order and its retreat pushes nation states to self-sufficiency and narrow nationalisms which in turn hamper international cooperations. Both cover stories of the economist tells us about the state of play of our world today, including the current unstable framework of international cooperation and democracy. Not the US channel rivalry and the resulting tensions in the wake, in its way, was one of the main causes and helped exacerbate the situations. But in my view, the root causes in the effectiveness of the world order following repeated failures to reform it since 1995. In the past 75 years, the world order 
based on the United Nations Charter was flawed for the most part. More than 40 years of Cold War rendered the United Nations Security Council unable to fully and effectively discharge its mandate for the maintenance of, of international peace and security. Disagreements within the two main protagonists in the Cold War, United States and the Soviet Union, and their allies were the prime cause. The charter-based world order was founded on the no notions that its permanent members will work in concert for international peace and security. Competing ideologies never actually made the existing world order truly liberal. The rise of China, which maintained its socialist communist ideology while exercising market economy, would make the reconstructions and restorations of a rule-based liberal order an impossible task. To establish a regional order in the Asia Pacific region, therefore, is a matter of necessity. Real politics dictates the need for compromise to live side by side in peaceful coexistence, starting with cooperation in areas where the United States and China have shared interests. This includes climate change, the Iran nuclear agreements, the North Korean nuclear issue, countering nuclear proliferation, LOS, COVID pandemic, and public health. The end of Cold War in, in the early 1990s ended by, pol by polar politics, which was replaced by multipolar politics. In reality, the United States was the only superpower for the last quarter of a century unchallenged at its played its hegemonic role in the world. Preoccupied by the war in Afghanistan and Iraq, the Obama administrations at late adopted a five-foot or rebalancing to prevent China from writing international rules. President Trump strengthened this as he viewed China as the US strategic competitor. President Biden continues the Trumpian approach by likewise identifying China as a new threat, the only competitor potentially capable of combining its economic, diplomatic, military and technological power to mount a sustained challenge to a stable and open international system. The construct of the Indo-Pacific was motivated by the emergence of China as a regional superpower and as a global challenge to the US dominance. Its flagship project, the first summit of the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue on March 12, is a building block for potential security architecture in what was the Asia Pacific. There are variants of the Indo Pacific concept, such as of Japan, India, and ASEAN. As non participants of Quads, ASEAN share the objective of promoting a greater cooperation among the rim countries of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. But as a group, it has difficulties in endorsing the underlying motive of countering and containing China. As Prime Minister of Singapore Lee Sin Long wrote in Foreign Affairs magazines last year, and I quote, Asia Pacific countries do not wish to be forced to choose between the United States and China, unquote, as they wish to cultivate good relation to both. Moreover, this aspect of the Indo-Pacific construct would divide ASEAN contrary to the court statement to support ASEAN unity and centrality. This come at a critical time when ASEAN is divided between independent-minded member countries and those which are inclined to side with China. ASEAN is also divided in dealing with the current crisis in Myanmar following the military coup on February the 1st, in which China factor plays an important role. The Myanmar crisis undermined democracy and the China factor complicated ASEAN efforts to promote democracy and constitutional government as mandated by its charter in a world where democracies everywhere are also declining. Support and cooperation of other Asian democracies, such as India, 
Japan and South Korea are crucial in ASEAN efforts to restore and promote democracy in Southeast Asia. And I thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, you've raised a number of points, um, starting with sort of the big picture of what the nature of compromise might be in, in a new rules-based order, but then uh, ending where I suspect uh, many of us hoped you would, which is the Indo-Pacific, uh, Asian, ASEAN perspective. And I know we'll come back to the role of regional organizations in, in democracy building uh, as well. We next uh, turn to Take Takehiko Nakao. Nakao-san used to run the Asian Development Bank among other institutions uh, and joins us uh, today as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very honored and pleased to join this meeting. And uh, uh, can, I, uh, can you hear me uh, clearly? Uh, so yes, and I'd uh, like to speak about the liberal uh, orders in terms of uh, the economic uh, system and political system. And in short, uh, these uh, liberal uh, orders should be preserved. And that, that is not the Western value, but it's a human value. And from uh, Meiji restoration, Japan wanted uh, the independence from uh, the imperialism of uh, the Western countries. And uh, the uh, Japanese pursued the democratic system in terms of constitutions, uh, parliament system, and uh, men's suffrage in 1925. So uh, any country wants to have a freedom of speech and the voices. It's not the Western value in my view. So about democracy, uh, uh, some people would say that uh, the sometimes more authoritative system is more efficient to uh, pass a certain uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, purpose, including uh, the uh, how to tackle the uh, pandemic. Uh, that's the argument in China. But overall, uh, uh, democracy is uh, better than other system because over long term, authoritative system is uh, uh, affected by the misjudgment based on the only good, uh, uh, good, uh, good uh, voices from uh, surrounding people and also repressions of uh, different years, also the uh, control of information system, informations and also corruption. So. The democracy is better than others, like uh, 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 Premier Churchill said previously. And uh, so oh, I think uh, we should uh, uh, strengthen the democratic system in many countries in the world. But uh, at the same time, uh, it is uh, so much uh, kind of uh, uh, the uh, challenged by many things, including the social media instead of established media, which is free speeches, but uh, it includes a lot of disinformation. And also the authorities of the countries, including scholars and uh, the government officials and uh, all those peoples, uh, the authority is uh, being challenged by the more populist ideas. And we cannot deny it because it is a people's idea. So how to cope with the populistic ideas or chauvinistic ideas and so on. So what do we need to do to uh, strengthen the democracy is uh, first that we must do that in each uh, countries and including uh, more equal uh, redistributions, education and public health, and also how to co cope with the, such a gigantic power of a platform company is a very important, uh, I think, uh, challenges to any countries. Uh, how to tax them and how about the competition policies and uh, the how we can use the competition policies to 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 take care of uh, the uh, the monopolies of powers of finance and uh, human resources and so on and uh, there was even the idea to have a certain defense uh, for themselves uh, in some countries so it is really risky isn't it to to, to uh, uh, preserve uh, our values. So that is about democracy and about liberal economic order, which is market-oriented policies, I would say. And that is the uh, essence of a uh, human development, isn't it? The exchange of uh, things, the uh, trade and uh, then division of labor between countries, uh, which country has a better uh, uh, making or something and others have different uh, uh, strength. And that is uh, 
a basic uh, uh, source of uh, human development. And even in 15th century, well, 12th century, there was a trade within Asia and also within Europe, and then it was uh, merged. So we should keep it. And I think uh, China itself is not a really state-guided uh, country. When we looked at the development of China after uh, the opening and reform, uh, which started in 1977, and the China became a uh, uh, market, so, uh, socialist market economy in 1993, uh, and then uh, it joined the WTO. So why China developed? It is not because of a state-guided policy, but it is because of market-oriented policies. And they passed to the better macroeconomic policies, and it is not so different from uh, Washington consensus in that regard. So I think uh, uh, still, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, there is a, a discussion that uh, in terms of use of data and uh, the uh, collection of data, the more authoritative uh, countries like China is better handling those things than others. But I think overall, uh, the market is uh, more important than the uh, state guided policies, and we should uh, keep uh, try to keep it. And uh, then I'd like to speak about the international order and uh, uh, first, we need to uh, protect, uh, try to strengthen the democracy and market system in our own countries. Because in my view, of course, multilateral system like the WTO and the United Nations are important. But uh, after all, uh, the sovereign states are representing the interest of uh, taxpayers and voters. And uh, that is a democratic system, isn't it? We cannot uh, uh, draw on the United Nations to decide something. We cannot uh, ask uh, EU to decide on behalf of all European countries. So it's a reality. And uh, to make uh, a democracy and the market strengthen, uh, we need to uh, strengthen the domestic system like uh, the media or the expertise of scholars and data collections by themselves and respect of uh, <coughs> separation of powers between the uh, judicial uh, uh, and uh, legislative <coughs> and, uh, and uh, administrative. And also the role of NPO and others are so important. Think tanks like this is really important to keep a democracy healthy. And the second point is uh, globalization is important, but hyper Globalization is too much in a sense uh, because uh, the uh, globalization or uh, the free trade in a sense uh, make uh, richer people richer in many countries and especially in, uh, because of uh, the uh, capital movement from uh, developed countries to developing countries, uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> producers or capitalist uh, uh, gain in many countries, especially in developed countries and middle class are so damaged. So as uh, Mr. Yerusa said, uh, I, I have a sympathy to the idea of uh, the uh, uh, workers, uh, labor uh, friendly, workers friendly uh, policies of the US because uh, we need to respect the value of uh, interest of workers uh, on top of a uh, capitalist. So how to do this by the, uh, income redistributions and uh, also policies regarding platform. And another point is about uh, the, uh, uh, so in that regard, we should adjust uh, the uh, hyper globalizations in terms of uh, security concerns of countries, uh, like uh, the secret of uh, security systems, and also the how to protect uh, intellectual property right, and also data of the people and uh, uh, health uh, 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 policies uh, like a pandemic, how to, how to uh, uh, prevent uh, the intrusions of a pandemic to countries. So we need a certain policy based on sovereign system. Sovereign system should be strengthened. The third point is about China. And uh, there is a lot of these discussions are about uh, China, isn't it? Uh, the China is, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, representing a kind of ideas that we are challenged. But I think uh, China uh, should also uh, take uh, more moderate policies because it gained a lot from uh, uh, liberal economic orders and also the political system, international system, which is based on the uh, uh, United States uh, power hegemon, but also because of uh, the uh, multilateral system. And uh, they regard itself as uh, just developing countries and they can do whatever they want to do. But in reality, it is damaging uh, China's own interest. Uh, and decoupling is uh, bad for uh, uh, the Asian countries and for, for, for uh, the United States, but it is also really bad for 
China because it has uh, developed uh, through the uh, coupling with the advanced technologies, including uh, uh, Japan and the United States, and also ASEAN countries. And ASEAN countries can play a very important role because it's a uh, 700 million populations and the three trillion dollars. Uh, uh, the GDP. So we should uh, uh, make uh, efforts to, uh, in a sense, involve China to the better direction because uh, China itself suffers from more, I mean, authoritative, assertive policies of uh, it. And, uh, we don't need to be entrapped in the cookie uh, uh, trap, which is uh, uh, the existing uh, hegemon is bullying uh, the uh, new power. It is not the, like that. We can cooperate. We, we, we can we can we can prosper by the cooperation instead of uh, trying to fight each other. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nakao-san. You you've made a number of points. You you raised something that we thought would be one of the drivers of this discussion, and so dived into the question of the digital platforms and social media as being a key uh, factor in, in democracy building and sometimes in fact in the erosion of democracy. Uh, you've also talked about how the next generation of global governance would have to include NGOs and civil society in more meaningful ways, uh, which might be what's driving some of the angst around what you correctly called hyper-globalization and its ill effects and then you concluded by, by reminding us that China is still an important player and that decoupling is perhaps easier said than done. And like unwinding from stimuli, it's something we're going to have to face. And, and so I, I know we will. Um, let's move now to the discussion period. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Sanjay. I've seen that Carlos Leal from Brazil has joined us and so, Carlos, I'm going to put you on notice as well to intervene for about three or four minutes after Sanjay on anything you've heard, if you want to. And um, I believe the rules of the game, uh, colleagues, are that if you go to the um, reactions button on your screen and press it, there is a raise hand function. So if you want to come in, and that includes Kudostan, uh, at any stage, you know, raise your hand and I'll see you. But, you know, if, if I don't see hands, I'll be sort of driving the discussion anyway. So Sanjay, you've been, uh, and I, I should say, I, I miss the fact that Monsieur Vedrin isn't with, with us because we would have got that very rich European Union perspective that he gives us at these meetings. Uh, but Sanjay, from where you sit and what you've heard. Um, uh, thank you, Rintan. Uh, let me say that, first of all, we are at a watershed moment in history. Yes, COVID has changed. It has challenged some of the most fundamental assumptions about our economies, about our governance systems, about the future of the liberal order or of globalization. There are lots of questions which countries are asking. And at a time like this, uh, and I'm especially glad that uh, you are chairing this panel, I admire the work which uh, you are doing as commissioner of uh, Center for New Economic Thinking. Uh, and I really believe that the, with the kind of work that you people are doing, this is the time not to be trapped in labels of a liberal order and what it implied. As you yourself said in your opening statement, it was an imperfect global liberal order, and that is why it went into the kind of problems we find ourselves in. And these problems arose before COVID. COVID did not hit a healthy world. The trouble was COVID hit a deeply afflicted world. The state of the world was such that its immune system was already very deeply compromised. And the global response therefore has also been, in many ways, I would say, nothing short of catastrophic. And you've seen how countries have responded. To combat a virus that has no respect of borders, nations responded by erecting boundaries first to the flow of information about the virus. Then came borders for life-saving equipment, for PPE kits, for pharmaceuticals, and hello, yes, now vaccines. And this is not just the doing of authoritarian regimes. Liberal democracies across Europe also have not sported too well in this manner. So the damage inflicted by the crisis has, we are living in a world where that damage has been irrevocably worsened uh, what were pre-existing inequalities in the system, made matters much worse. 
We are today in an even more unequal world uh, where the least developed countries, as you, as you yourself point out, having little to spend, are having to cut down on essential healthcare, vaccination <laughs> programs. And you see the, on the other side, richer countries throwing everything they have at the pandemic. So as Rufus said, yes, the big state is back. It is back because the crisis needed intervention. And the big state is also back because many states leverage technology to respond to the pandemic in ways that would have been unthinkable in many democracies in the past. The state is back, but this is not the welfare state invented after the debris of World War II. But that was a different state. That state rode on the back of a burgeoning middle class from the taxes it collected from the middle class. Today, you're in a world where that middle class has been shrinking and is going to go on shrinking further and further because of the issues we have been facing on what is happening in the world of you know, technology companies. You are in a, in a situation where certain businesses will tend to be natural monopolies because the whole idea of scale has changed. So how do you how do you handle these situations? So that is why you know, the whole idea of new economic thinking, a new economic thinking for a new world order, how that is going to come about, that is something which a lot of organizations need to do a lot of hard work. As far as you know, I come from uh, emerging economy, I see the developing world heading for a deep balance of payments crisis and a deep debt crisis. The question today, therefore, is more about the kind of order that will accelerate rather than constrain action to undertake national and global intervention that can rescue economies from the current distress and get them back on the path for normal flow of investments and trade. Normal flow of investments and trade are not going to come naturally by just, just opening up doors. So you, you are in a crisis where there is a problem. You have seen project finance for infrastructure already disappear, has now almost completely vanished. And, and that challenge is going to mount, which is going to exacerbate conditions in the LDCs. And frankly, as far as you know, the pandemic is concerned, we all know that the world is not safe till everybody is safe. So there, there are questions which we will we'll need to answer, uh, how this is going to recover. And if the world order, to conclude, I'll say the world order has to recover. Uh, the next few years cannot be about trade and technology wars. They cannot be about IPR rights or vaccines. They cannot be about Senkaku or wielding batons across the line of actual control. They have to be about recovery, recovery of health, recovery of economies, which have been incapacitated by the virus, about restoring jobs and livelihood, and addressing the inequalities that have been greatly exacerbated by COVID. Thank you, I'll stop here. The, the big state is back, but it's, it's also uneven. The big state is back in countries that have the fiscal room uh, to expand. And, and yesterday I mentioned how, you know, um, advanced countries have spent about 26% of their GDP during COVID uh, as an expansion. Uh, emerging markets, 6%, developing countries, 2%. So the big state is expanding unevenly. And second, the old discussions around market failure versus state failure haven't gone away. So I, th I think you're quite right, as was Rufus, to raise this issue. Uh, and and uh, I'd be interested to hear now from Carlos. Carlos, do you want to unmute and intervene or not, as you wish? Good morning to everyone or good afternoon in Tokyo. Thank you. Uh, I'm listening, and a better saying, I have been listening for a long time, uh, but we have to go back to the old liberal order. I'm afraid that will not happen. We may have, we may go to a new liberal order, but not to the old one. Because the old one had certain underlying assumptions 
that will not be true in the future. The first assumption is that basically you have an international reserve currency, the dollar, which the United States is willing to print more and more or issue debt. So growing debt forever or printing money was a good strategy while there were no competitors. But the euro was created 18 years ago, and now you have the mighty of China, the economic mighty of China. Therefore, if we go back to a new liberal order, if we go to a new liberal order, we will have something different from what happened in the past. The ability to tax other regions of the world that the US had through Saint Orage is not going to happen again in the same form and with the same intensity. And therefore, it will have to choose where to put its money, either in innovation, infrastructure, or the military. So we are moving towards a new equilibrium, an equilibrium where polarization will exist. Not the polarization we see, but islands where you will trade inside, but trade amongst islands will be limited to commodities or to very, very high technology products. We see uh, the Europeans taxing the American tech companies, putting fines on them. We see the DOJ in the US replicating and taxing or putting fines on European banks and so forth. So the name of the game nowadays is not corporations anymore, but competition. And therefore, I think that we'll have to create a new world order, a new liberal world order from different assumptions, not from the same assumptions. Thank you. Does anyone want to sort of react to what's been said? Uh, and let me flag sort of, uh, two, two things on which I'd be interested. Uh, Nakao-san, go ahead. Yeah, can I? Can I? Are you? I cannot hear you, uh, Mr. Venetola. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So, China uh, uh, is a big state or not? And I think uh, market economies, even if a market is an uh, engine, and we shouldn't uh, prevent uh, that uh, kind of uh, functions of money. Um, the government uh, has a very important role to set the uh, like a judicial system and so on, or intellectual. So it has a very important role for redistribution and also ensure the education for all, edu uh, all and so on. And also, uh, government can play important as a, of a externality. One is uh, the environment, so like a negative externality, but also positive externality. The other countries can do it, uh, like research and so on. Uh, so that's what the very important when we face uh, challenges for plot. So uh, the new trust, uh, uh, I mean, the law, uh, antitrust law is uh, maybe needed. Uh, it is a uh, Pax Americana. Carlos uh, some mentioned that uh, we cannot return to the original uh, uh, liberal order, which is based on the dollar reserve currency. But in my view, there is no alternative to the dollar. And I don't think RMB can be like uh, the dollar because uh, the US has a credibility of uh, uh, relatively reasonable policies, economic policies, and also 
the uh, uh, kind of uh, the uh, hegemons, uh, which is uh, more, I mean, uh, for the e interest of the international community as a whole, even if uh, the US made some mistakes, I think it is uh, more credible than other countries. So, and also the uh, US financial system is very strong and it's already established. And also it is uh, the kind of network externality. So I'm not flattering the US, but I don't think uh, the China can replace uh, the US in that uh, regard. But uh, uh, what is more important is how we can keep uh, the US as a uh, hegemon, which uh, uh, for for the Pax Americana mo moderate version to the interest of uh, the world, if uh, the U.S. recedes from uh, the international affairs, is really uh, disruptive. And uh, so, how we can keep uh, the U.S. as an important player, which is not too assertive, which is not uh, trying to uh, uh, to topple uh, some countries' uh, uh, governments and so on, like CIA did uh, before in the Latin American countries. But how we can keep uh, the U.S., which is uh, very dynamic and uh, relatively fair. Kind of uh, government uh, to to the uh, to the international system, and uh, to do that, uh, the U.S. Uh, needs uh, a more strengthening of democracy, and uh, which can be supported by people in the United States instead of uh, the divide uh, between uh, the com uh, republic or democratic or uh, some uh, identity politics kind of things. So we need a strong U.S. and we need uh, engagement of a strong U.S fair US to the international order. So I have a, a little bit different uh, kind of ideas uh, from what Carlson said. Of course, we need a new order, but which is not uh, the kind of uh, replacing the US power by others, including China. Rufus, you had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to say that, well, I, I certainly agree with a lot of what Sanjoy and, and Carlos said. I mean, I, I think you're right, Sanjoy, the, the pandemic did hit a world that already had a compromised system, a compromised health. Uh, and uh, that has made the situation even worse and the way governments have reacted, it has not been encouraging. And I, I think Carlos is right. And, and I said it at the outset that I don't, I don't see us going back to precisely resetting the world the way it was before the last uh, not just the last uh, year of the pandemic, the last uh, decade or more, 20 years of, um, you know, failures of multilateral cooperation, the growth of authoritarianism and the rest. But I do think maybe we've, I'm worried about too pessimistic a tone here about what the opportunities are for moving forward and actually creating something that we need now, which is a different kind of systemic uh, consolidation among uh, like-minded uh, governments and countries around the world. I, I do think that, you know, the old saying that a, a pessimist sees a glass that's half empty, an optimist sees a glass that half full, and an engineer sees a glass that's twice as big as it needs to be. I think we have to think a little bit like engineers in figuring out what it is that the world needs right now that our political systems can um, respond to uh, successfully. And, and in this thinking, I mean, what I would say is that uh, we are going to have to be much more pragmatic. I, I think a lot of the sort of visionary ideology that created this notion of a WTO system where everybody was um, like-minded countries adhering to the same system of rules um, looks fairly naive now in hindsight. I think it looked great in the 1990s when we created it, uh, but now what we're dealing with is different systems moving at different speeds. And I think alliances among uh, countries are going to be critical here in defining who has a sort of majority view of how the world should evolve. I would like to think that we can create a new sort of force in the world of democratically elected market economies that will push back on the growth of authoritarianism and the growth of mercantilism in a way that reinforces the combination of democratic decision-making 
with market oriented approaches, but we will only succeed with that if we're able to do things in those democratically elected market economies that address inequality, that restore a stable middle class and a stable distribution of wealth within our own systems, and that have the necessary defusing mechanisms to prevent the kind of trade war mentality that we saw over the last four years. Is it your sense that the new administration in the US is, is going to be able to achieve that given uh, that it has, as you pointed out, sort of domestic priorities to take care of and these are not always uh, sort of supportive of the sort of quite broad statement you made about the reconstruction of the liberal order. What, what's your sense of how this might play out? I mean, my sense is that obviously Biden is very focused at first on his own domestic challenges, because remember, we've had a near death experience in our democratic institutions here. And so we can't really be very well equipped to help restore this global alliance of what I call democratically elected market economies if we can't stabilize at home. So I think the next year or two, two years really is critical to his being able to achieve that. And it's not yet clear if that will succeed. Um, I think the stakes are very high because if it doesn't succeed, I think, um, you know, I, I shudder to think what we go back to here and how much we will not be able to contribute to the pushing back on authoritarianism and uh, nationalistic tendencies around the world. But I think if we do succeed with it, and I, you know, I would, I would liken it to maybe the challenges that Franklin Roosevelt had in the 1930s. I don't know that there's a, a more uh, apt parallel than that. Um, I think if, if, if he is successful, uh, then I think you know, the question will become how are other governments um, equipped to also move in the same direction uh, have we moved too far already into kind of regional and, and competitive blocks or can we, can we then work together to, to create this, like Carlos said, it needs to be a new system. I think it'll have to be based on some of the existing pillars. I, I don't think we're just going to abolish the UN and the WTO and the World Bank and the IMF. We have to Re, we have to uh, repurpose them to the to this future um, system that that we want to create. Carlos, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, perhaps Nakao San uh, misinterpreted uh, what I said. I didn't say that the dollar would be substituted in the whole world. It may recede in certain parts of the world. Uh, the U.S. government is talking now about increasing the, its economic package from $1.9 trillion to $3 trillion. Debt will inevitably increase, and much beyond the 100% of GDP. It will be very difficult fiscally afterwards increase interest rates simply because interest will be too high unless you start taxing. What is the easiest way to get taxes e fast? Not now. Now they are not going to do this. But within two years from now, if we are successful in uh, re-engineering the economy, a national VAT, something like that, a tax on consumption, an ad valor in taxes somewhere. And that, of course, will create the possibility that never existed in the US, which is a certain increase in the degree of oligopolization. The world is going to change because of that, if that happens. And there are many other issues on the table too. The interaction between geopolitics, 
the international reserve role of a dollar and the internal constraints of the US, it's, it exists and it's going to play a very important game. And China, of course, will try to play that game, but it won't be the major player. The major player will be the American public opinion. It wants relief, fast, fast relief. The only thing is that you cannot increase your indebtedness by 20% every year and not pay a price for that. So I think that uh, we are bound to see some changes one way or another because of the fiscal problems of the United States and its interaction with geopolitics. The world liberal order had several stages, different stages, and we talk about them. When we talk about the liberal order, we think that it was the same thing for the last uh, 150 years. That was not so. So we are ending a period, and I hope we are beginning a new one, which entrance will be very different. So that's what I had to, to, to say now. Thank you. Sanjay, you wanted to come in, and then I, I do want to go to Mr. Urajudo as well. Uh, thank, thank you. Just a brief intervention. No, I'm, I'm not being pessimistic about it. I want the, what, I, what I'd like to say is, you see, if uh, I spoke about the debt crisis, which is going to be afflicting many LDCs, if the diet in the wool liberal free market solution to this crisis is going to be greater austerity, then the liberal world may already have lost the battle. So this is a time for G7 as well as various multilateral financial institutions to start thinking out of the box, change traditional modes of thinking, how to address this problem, which is going to hit many of the LDCs. Uh, even coming to the you know, developed world, we know that stagnating and declining incomes, rising inequality between, you know, within nations had already changed the nature of politics in the last 10 years. And you saw a new kind of politics. You saw the snake oil brand of politician rise to the front. You know, I will not credit them with the name populists. Well, this is the world we had entered. So how you know, we need to prevent getting back into the same kind of situation. So we have to, you know, if, if we kind of break up the argument, we have two extreme arguments. One extreme hopes that this is the time to push deep economic reforms that will create conditions for the recovery of a new liberal international order riding on free markets, but with reconfigured supply chains. The other opposite side thinks that this is the best time to push competitively, belligerently, and show rivals their place, change the world order, unseat existing hegemons or pretenders, and establish the new god. Both sides are wrong. Both sides will need to work with each other to pull each other out of this hole. Mr. Wirju, how do you react to what you've been hearing? You should unmute. Yes, I, was, I should. Uh, I wish to briefly comment on two things. Number one, on democracy and the COVID-19 pandemic. Initially, uh, democracy was given a bad name uh, in comparison to authoritarian uh, regimes. It was thought the authoritarian regime was more effective in coping with the COVID-19. But in fact, to me, democracy are doing quite well as well. Look at the case of India, the largest uh, country in the world, has been doing very well. Uh, likewise, Indonesia, the fourth largest, 
uh, in terms of the number, the total number of cases and uh, death, uh, we are fine. We are doing quite well. Likewise, the speed that our government is proceeding with the va vaccinations. Um, of course, uh, authoritarian countries like China, Vietnam, to some extent, really, uh, uh, Singapore did quite well. But don't forget that others like Taiwan, uh, South Korea, New Zealand, and Australia, all are democratic uh, countries, are doing very well as well. But to me, it depends on not on whether uh, governments are democratic or authoritarian, but it depends on whether uh, governments are effective and that the people listen and trust their governments. Uh, of course, the case of the United States uh, give a bad name on democracy because they have prolonged debates until uh, Biden came to power, even on simple uh, issue of to wear or not to wear uh, masks. Uh, <clears throat> Second, on the, role, on, on the promotion of democracy. In fact, in the past five six, or six years, there is no leader in the world on democracy promotions. Europe has been very much preoccupied with its own effort to reconcile their own European values with the so many anti-things, uh, anti-migrants, anti-foreigners, anti-Islam, uh, all the phobias. But uh, uh, I think for this, we need to restore. We welcome this, the commitment of the Biden's government to actively promote democracy, at the same time to restore, restore democratic uh, deficit at home. And, and when we talk about new uh, liberal order, democracy is a, a key question here. Uh, so much was mentioned about democracy and economic uh, system. And don't underestimate the needs uh, on promotions of democracy all over the world, including, as I've mentioned earlier in our own regions, my own regions of Southeast Asia. And thank you very much. So as we move into the final leg of our panel, um, I'm going to ask each of you to sort of make a wrap up statement of around a minute so that we end on time. We owe that to the organizers. But uh, Mr. Urjut, I did, I did want to ask you because you raised it now and also in your opening comments. Um, when we see what's happening in Myanmar, uh, and we think about the regional organization best placed to do a peer pressure and peer review, as it were, which is ASEAN. Um, is this about democracy or is it about effective government? What might be or what should be an ASEAN position on events like what's going on in Myanmar? I think first and foremost, it's about uh, democracy. Uh, Myanmar has not fu uh, fully yet a full-fledged democracy. In fact, Myanmar is a, it was in a difficult process since 2015 on its democratic transitions. Uh, the military is still a powerful institution. It's controlled 25% of seats in parliaments, but likewise, they have a say in nomination of important posts, ministerial posts. Uh, of course, democracy closely relates to uh, good governance. And in fact, as the military has so much power, there was no one that controlled the military in their military business, in their politics and others. So it is a difficult issue for ASEAN as Myanmar coup d'etat is two or three step backward in the promotions of democracy. Likewise, it is a, a implicated ASEAN. And, but the China factor, as I mentioned earlier, complicates the problem because if ASEAN and other countries push too hard to the current military regime, China, I mean, uh, Myanmar would be uh, fully embraced uh, by China. And for that matter, uh, 
ASEAN is still in the process of designing what would be the right approach. President Jokowi has called for an ASEAN summit to be held soon, but we know ASEAN is also divided. For those in, in particular, by those who interpreted non-interference on domestic affairs in such a static concept. Uh, and that, for that matter, even ASEAN as family was taught by these uh, five or six countries as uh, should not interfere in what is happening now in Myanmar. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so for wrap up statements of no more, more than a minute each, please, I thought we'd go in reverse order from the opening and therefore uh, start with you, Carlos. I would say that the game is afoot. You have to redefine everything. You have to understand what democracy means to each country. You have to understand how the economy interacts with that definition, what is possible, what is not possible for that country, and try to come to a compromise. This has to be set step by step, so don't aim too high. We start step by step. Try to preserve what we have now for a while. Try to modernize it, but go step by step because the changes, the required changes may be too large. Thank you. Sanjay? Uh, thanks, Renton. Uh, I'll say again that you know, if, if the world order has to recover, if we're we talking of international world order once again, uh, call it liberal, call it whatever, does not matter. Our priorities have to be right and we have to come together for those priorities. The priorities have to be about recovery recovery of health, recovery of economies incapacitated by the virus, about, you know, it's going to be about restoring jobs and livelihoods and addressing the inequalities that have been greatly, greatly exacerbated by COVID. Now, if we start addressing these priorities together and build the measures and institutions which can do this, I think we are on the right track. Eventually, yes, we will have the world we are all aspiring to. Nakao Uh, oh yeah, uh, okay. So you raised a very important issue of uh, Myanmar because it's a very important uh, uh, kind of a uh, case uh, case uh, for whether we can keep uh, democratic order strengthening or weakening. And I think uh, if we look at this, uh, by the way, I was involved in the Myanmar uh, cases, uh, uh, democratic uh, uh, democratizations and market oriented economies uh, as a uh, president of ADB and before that as a vice uh, minister of uh, Ministry of Finance to support the clearance of areas so that uh, the country can join the international system like ADB or the World Bank and IMF and uh, the lifting uh, sanctions by the US for the US. I has been very deeply involved in Myanmar, and it was very shocking to see this resetting, receding of a democratic system and also the market-oriented economy because it is to the interest of the people of Myanmar, and also it is to the interest of even the military system to keep this uh, kind of a market-oriented uh, growth uh, strategy. So uh, if we look at that one, although it's not uh, zero or one uh, kind of a choice a bit of uh, democracy because in a way, Rokhine uh, issues is, uh, has happened because of a uh, uh, democratic uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, reform so that people can make a voice and the majority uh, Buddhist uh, peoples, uh, in a sense, wanted to expel the kind of uh, these uh, my minority Islamic people. So uh, democratic system, democracy is not a panacea. It's not uh, the uh, uh, kind of uh, the uh, 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 solve every issue because it can also impact some issues if uh, it is a majority is repressions for minorities. So we need a uh, uh, very strong institution like uh, once again media and freedom of speeches and so on. But uh, uh, we need to go to the democracy because we need a freedom of speeches. Once again, it's not the Western value. Anyone wants uh, 
our, our the freedom of speeches and also freedom from uh, the imperialism or the uh, the uh, uh, the prevalence of, uh, for instance, Western imperial power. So we need to be humble that the countries have uh, different issues for each country, but democracy. And we, it's very clear, as uh, Mr. Uh, Weira Judah said, uh, that the uh, Myanmar people themselves really want to have a democracy. Thank you. Mr. Weira Judah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, you're on. Okay. Uh, I shared, as I also said earlier, uh, uh, I mean, as I repeat, I share what Mr. Carlos just said and something that I said earlier in my uh, interventions, that in the end, we have to come to a compromise. Uh, China will stay for many years to come. Uh, and for that matter, in line with what's, uh, President Biden's uh, policy to cooperate and compete, I think for the time being, it is important for the U.S. to promote more cooperation in the areas whereby the U.S. and China have set interests. <clears throat> On international order or international liberal order, uh, a world in absence of a worldwide international order, uh, it is impossible, uh, it is impossible task to rebuild one. So I would say that to build a regional order in East Asia and the Pacific is a matter of utmost importance. And for that matter, the US should not uh, in promoting, uh, contributing to regional order, uh, it should be more inclusive in nature rather than to have that uh, divisive concept as uh, Indo-Pacific and uh, the quads. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Rufus Yerkson. So um, I can't argue with what Carlos has said about the risks now to uh, financial stability and and even sort of economic and political stability from you know an era when debt is going to significantly exceed a hundred percent of GDP. How long can we keep that up? What are the consequences? Um, but I think that's the moment we're in, and it's unavoidable for the time being until we start to see what kind of a recovery we have from the pandemic. To me, the most important thing, however is what is going to happen in the large democracies of the world and what direction will their politics take and what kind of leaders will they select? If we continue a trend that was going on before Biden won the election in the United States towards authoritarianism with a fundamental disbelief in economic cooperation with economic and political nationalism being put at the forefront, partly in reaction to what's happening in places like China. But if we don't reverse that trend, not just in the US, but elsewhere, if we aren't electing leaders who both believe in democratic institutions and in cooperation between countries to temper our competition, we're going to have an era of vigorous competition in, in a world of new technologies and, and emerging trends in, in the development of our economies. But if we have cooperation that tempers that competition rather than authoritarianism that exacerbates it, then we have a chance of creating this new order that we've talked about. But if that doesn't happen, if we move back towards more authoritarianism, to me, that will be, uh, will be potentially fatal. So I think the critical thing we have to look at over the next coming years is what direction do publics in these, in these large uh, democratic societies take? If they move in the right direction, we have hope. And that's a very... Uh good spot to end this very rich discussion in. We've had a very varied discussion 
on the nature of liberalism, democracy, and where we might be headed, uh, I would have been floored if we actually arrived at a solution. But what we've done is pointed out various ways forward, the various of immense cleavages that remain uh, economic, social, political, cultural. Uh, but it is important, uh, as so many of you said, and as Rufus said at the end, that cooperation and competition balance each other. And that, in many ways, is the summary of global governance uh, through history. Uh, so we, we will leave it at that and pick up perhaps certainly in the next session and then next year as well. So I will now turn it over back to Kudosan. And thank you all for joining again. Mr. Rohinton, thank you very much for your wonderful chairmanship, moderatorship, and I also would like to I also would like to thank all the panelists for your participation. So right now it's eight thirty five in Japan time in Five minutes, we will start this uh, COVID-19 session. So as was scheduled uh, at 8.40 Japan time, uh, this uh, global health uh, session will start. So the panelists um, in the session, and please be remain seated. And uh, when the time comes, uh, please uh, switch on your video. And so this is going to be the last session on global health, COVID-19. Why did the world mishandle its response to the coronavirus crisis? That is the theme. So please uh, do participate in that last session, which will start in five minutes. 